thank you for uh, inviting me to be part of this. I've, uh, I live in Oregon. I live in an in-holding on the Siskiyou National Forest and I've been here for 30 years. So I've spent a lot of time in our public forests and I love them very dearly and um, have a lot of concerns about them. And it's really motivated some of my activities over the last decade or so, uh, trying to see if we could do a better job of dealing with all the burn piles out there. And what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is on-site biochar production in the forest or nearby. Um, and, the and I'm first gonna talk about the techniques we use for that. Then I'm gonna talk about how do we use the biochar that we make if we're gonna save a lot of effort not moving biomass to a central facility to make biochar. Maybe we could also save some effort by applying the biochar in the forest or near the forest where it's needed. And then I'm gonna talk about various efforts and projects and programs we've been developing to share the knowledge that we have gained. So here's the technique that we use and it's, I've given it a name, it's flame carbonization. And it's really just a form of gasification or making biochar um, in an open flame in a gasification process. And the reason why we can make biochar in an open flame and not just in a closed vessel is because of the way that biomass burns and it burns in three stages. The first stage being dehydration or loss of water vapor. And the second stage is the loss of the gases, the wood gases where a lot of the energy is. Those gases are what burns in a flame. When you don't see the flame, you often see smoke. So uh, smoke is just the condensed gases that didn't burn. Um, then we, once those gases are gone, the biomass burns in a completely different way because now it's a solid fuel, it's charcoal, and it can only burn when uh, oxygen physically contacts that solid fuel. And that's our opportunity to stop the process and to keep it from going to ash and, and retain the char. So I picked up on this uh, idea of using a flame cap kiln when I heard about these Japanese cone kilns. And I don't know how long they've been used in Japan, but it's a very simple process. And this diagram on the right shows how it works. The flame is actually your, your heat source and your heat exchanger because it transfers heat to the biomass by radiation. And then the, the char that's formed is saved from combustion because there's the, you know, there's no air coming from the bottom. So unlike some other gasifiers you might know about, there's no bottom air. Um, and there's a lot of advantages to this. How the airflow does work is uh, what we call a counter current flow. So all the air comes from above. And we oftentimes in these devices see a lot of these curly flames. That's the real indication that the air for combustion is coming from above. This keeps the flame close to the, the biomass and that's an advantage from a heat transfer standpoint. Uh, during my work, we've developed a couple of refinements to these techniques. The first one we called the Oregon kiln. And this was a, um, a truncated pyramid. It's got a solid bottom. It's uh, quenched by flooding. It has a drain uh, five feet across on the top, four feet on the bottom. The sloped sides are, are nice for stacking the kilns, but they're really not an, a, a terribly important part of the process. Um, so we could stack these up, you know, three or four high and put them on a trailer and, and take multiple kilns out into, onto our site and use them. But they're heavy, uh, 200 pounds. So we, I wanted to develop something that was more mobile and lighter weight, easier to move around that uh, didn't always require a, a full forestry crew to use. So I came up with this ring of fire kiln idea, a refinement of it. Um, that has also a heat shield, which really improves the efficiency of carbonization and the emissions. And I'm now selling these. So I'm, a, I'm my company is now manufacturing and selling these are made in the US here in Oregon. And uh, you can see from the, the, the specifications there that no single piece of this weighs more than 40 pounds. So that means that just about anybody can take one of these, load it in the back of a standard or even a small pickup, take it out to a site and uh, two people can move it around and set it up and use it. Um, so let me know if you're interested in purchasing one or maybe a dozen. So with all the kilts that we have used and that we've observed other people using uh, these technologies uh, can kind of divide them into three types. Um, 
and according to mobility, the type of feedstock they can use and how they're operated. So the first type is what I would call a small bin kilns. They have a solid bottom uh, and they can be moved by hand crews or by dragged around with an ATV. They're fed by hand and they're usually flood quenched. Then there are also large bin kilns so like this one from Utah, Darren McAvoy from Utah State University and the Utah Forest Service has developed this kiln. This is a much bigger kiln. It's sort of a dumpster size, I think 10, 10 cubic yards or so. And it can be loaded with the machine, a small excavator, or it can be hand loaded. And it also is flood quenched and can use larger materials since it's a larger kiln and develops more heat energy. And then the, the third category here is what I call panel kilns. So the ring of fire kiln is one, but it's any, any kind of kiln that might be assembled in sections and it can't be flood quenched because it doesn't have a solid bottom. You seal the bottom with dirt. Um, all these can also be quenched by snuffing it with a lid. Now I want to talk about applications for the material that we make on site. And there's three that we've looked at, small farms, forest soils, and burned area recovery. I developed these, we developed these kilns and I developed them with a, with a crew of people, a team called the Umqua Biochar Education Team out of Roseburg, Oregon. And we uh, developed them through, uh, supported by grant funds from the NRCS as Conservation Innovation Grant. And the idea here was that in Oregon, a lot of our farmers have woodland as well. And so we, we looked for participation from our farmers who had woodlands and livestock because they have two waste streams here, the, the woody debris and the manure, that if we could combine them, we could create some value. And um, that's, this program is how we develop the kilns and the techniques. And out of this program, the NRCS created a new practice uh, CSP practice 384 under the conservation stewardship program that is now paying around 5,000 an acre to make biochar on site. So if you're, if that intrigues you, contact your local NRCS office. Here's one of the farms we worked with, the Goat Dairy um, Willowit Ranch. And the practice we developed was that uh, once a week they would put two buckets of biochar on the really wet part of the barn and also add some uh, EM1, which is a, like a silage inoculant. It's a lactobacillus to acidify the char a little bit, drop the pH. It works really well. And what they found was uh, after doing this for a year or so, they ran out of their own biochar and they went and bought some. So that's another benefit of teaching these techniques to a wide audience is that it can create demand actually for commercial biochar projects but, or products. Here's what they found uh, in, in addition to reducing the odors all over a long term, the, the pack um, in the barn, the compost or the, the manure pack started composting in place. So not only did they improve the barn environment for the animals, they, um, when they did clean out the pack, it was already composted uh, and they sell the compost. So it was really a lot of benefit for a small amount of biochar there on that farm. Now, what about forest soils? Well, the thing that, you know, as Jim Archuleta mentioned, uh, forest soils have biochar naturally from, uh, you know, especially in the West here, our fire adapted forests have a lot of char. In fact, up to half of the carbon in the forest soils might be charcoal. And, but what we're seeing is that in the more recent soil horizons, since we've been uh, suppressing fires, um, they're missing that char component and maybe it's something they really need. Um, so this is an example of, uh, that, that illustrates maybe this char is something that would really help our forest. This is in my backyard and the, those are pine trees there. And they're about 15 feet away from that bag of biochar that was sitting there for maybe nine months. And I went one day to, to take the biochar out of it to use it. And I found that the bag was full of these roots. And they were from those pine trees over there. It was, they were growing right up through the ground into that bag of plain raw biochar, nothing added to it. So here they are <laughs> pulling these roots out and the fine root hairs are going right into these little char particles. So it seems like there's, there, the trees like biochar. And uh, so let's, let's give them some biochar.
Um, this, these pictures are, uh, so we've made a lot of biochar in the woods and left it in the woods. And I went back a year later to one of the sites where we worked and saw all these, uh, you know, mushrooms and herbs and orchids growing right up through the biochar. So the understory plants and the, the fungi also seem to get along quite well with biochar and, and thrive on it. Um, so here's one of the projects that was done under the NRCS CSP 384 practice. And this is the U Creek Land Alliance in Oregon. What they're trying to do here is create a ridgeline fire break to protect some legacy old growth trees from a nearby young plantation. So yeah, so here's that, that uh, operation at U Creek. They used a variety of different kilns. One of the kilns they used was a panel kiln using um, uh, rec making a rectangular shape there. And they use this little mini excavator there to load it. So you can definitely combine the mechanization and the hand techniques um, out in the field. Uh, this slide here is, uh, shows um, one of the legacy oaks at that site that they're trying to protect by doing the thinning of the small pines and firs that grow up around them. The, uh, so now I want to talk a little bit about burned area recovery. Um, Jim mentioned being evacuated this year. I was as well for more than two weeks. The Slater fire actually burned up my water line, <laughs> but my house did not burn, thank goodness. So, and of course the, the most horrendous uh, wildfire situation we've seen in the last couple of years was here in Paradise, California, the, the 2018 campfire that uh, killed a lot of people um, and uh, thousands of homes were burned. So uh, um, Steve Fair from the from Butte Community College, who's doing a lot of biochar projects with his students, invited me to come and help landowners in Paradise and nearby areas do some property cleanup. So last January we went, took a bunch of kilns there, worked with students, um, college students to uh, take some of this debris that from all the dead trees uh, and turn it into biochar. And I don't have a lot of experience myself in, with um, erosion control, but this is a real, one of the, the really concerning consequences of these large, um, highly in, intense fires is that we start losing soil um, because of the, the severe effects. So if we're making biochar on site, on site, how can we use it on site to maybe help recover some of these burned areas? I think it's a question I would like to get some answers to. Could we use the biochar in wattles or hydro mulch or combine it with this PAM? Here's a few references I found that indicate there might be some potential there. So now I wanna talk about uh, how we're sharing the knowledge. So since I, uh, you know, we completed this NRCS Conservation Innovation Grant. A lot of people want to hear about what we learned. And I've been spending a lot of my time the last few years doing workshops um, sponsored by state forestry services from North Dakota to Kansas, um, Oregon as well, and soil and water conservation districts uh, who interact a lot with the smaller landowners and larger landowners who are um, interested in conservation they've uh, been very interested in bringing this knowledge to their members. And here's an example of one of the workshops that I've done. This was um, just north where I live, Soil and Water Conservation District. This is a neighborhood here in Sunny Valley. And these neighbors all have a common concern about wildfire. And so they're getting together to uh, protect, you know, clear out fuels near their homes and um, they, they were very excited to work together then to make biochar. And so one of the things about this on-site biochar production is it's a social activity uh, that a lot of people enjoy engaging in. The uh, pictures I'm gonna show now are from the Redwood Forest Foundation project that um, I was involved in just last week. Uh, and this is the new Riga fire kiln. Uh, they bought five of the kilns from me that they're using with a, a California Conservation Corps crew. And uh, that's the site we worked at. And that was a, a landing, very nice, easy site to work with all the fuel already prepped by this hand crew. Uh, the picture in the right, lower right corner shows more maybe a, a typical um, uneven ground where we might be using these kilns and they'll work just fine there. 
Um, here's some pictures of the kilns in operation, the CCC crews. Uh, the, I'm really happy with this new design. The heat shield really improves the efficiency and the emissions, very little smoke. And uh, we made a, a, a yard and a half of char in um, three hours in one of these. This uh, next picture shows the process of unloading the char. So the, it's a panel kiln, one of the panels comes loose and you rake it out and um, that helps lose the heat. So you don't need that much water to quench it. You spray it with a, maybe 50, 150 gallons, I think is probably all we used of water and rake it thin and then you've got your char. Uh, I, people ask a lot about the quality of char from flame cap kiln. And so a few years back, a uh, uh, um, scientist in New Zealand, John McDonald Wari, uh, offered to test biochar samples and I sent him some samples from cone kilns. And he, looking at the Raman spectroscopy, he, he um, determined that the, um, tr the the treatment temperature, which really determines biochar characteristics was definitely above 600 degrees centigrade, possibly 1000 degrees centigrade. So this means that our the carbon in this char from flame cap kilns, if they're operated correctly, is, is generally going to be very recalcitrant, a high amount of recalcitrant uh, char. So at the end of the day, uh, last week out in the Redwood Forest with the CCC crew, we went through some calculations to figure out, you know, how much carbon did we sequester during this um, during this project. So we made four cubic yards of biochar in about three hours of time, burn time using three kilns. Four cubic yards is about 800 pounds dry mass. And uh, when you multiply that by 80% um, for the recalcitrant carbon um, percentage estimated and then the conversion factor to CO2, that's equivalent to about one metric ton of CO2 sequestration we could Definitely have done a lot more with this nice big crew, at least three or four times as much um, in a day. Uh, and they were thrilled to hear that. You know, uh, I think it really meant something to these young people because at the end of the day, um, you know, we need to deploy this at scale. We need to train a workforce to do this work out in the woods. A lot of it is very close to the ground kind of work. You just can't get it, you can't mechanize all of it. And we need, we need trained firefighters too. So working on different projects now to kind of ramp up um, workforce training in, in these forestry fields. And if those of you may have heard me talk about um, these ideas before, but I really think what we need is what I would call a carbon conservation core, a new CCC. So many social benefits here, as well as forest health benefits and, and safety from wildfire benefits. Let's pay our youth to sequester carbon and biochar. It's meaningful to them. And you know, hope for the future is something that's in a little bit short supply right now. So that's all I have for you and thank you very much.